What's up, friends? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Brady with Comeback Story. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, then this was a live broadcast of a live Q&A that we're doing on our Facebook page every couple of weeks or so. And if you're on Facebook, if you're on, uh, yeah, if you're on Facebook, then welcome. Thanks for joining us and feel free to pop in questions, comments. Uh, today, I'm really excited about my guest. Got my buddy, Yaku. What's up, man? How's it going? It's going great. It's going, it's going good so far. <laughs> it's good. It's early. The coffee is still kicking in. Yeah, man. So I brought on Yaku with me today for today's q and I wanted to talk to him about um, kind of some misconceptions about Gen Z. I guess it could be millennials too. I'm kind of lumped in that bucket. But um, well, first, let me go back. Yaku, tell us about yourself. What do you do? Who are you? What what fires you up? What gets you out of bed in the morning? How much time do I have to answer that question? <laughs> as much time as you want. <laughs> um, so real quick, my I'm originally from South Africa. I moved to the States in 93. Uh, my parents went to Michigan first and then South Africans. It was way too cold. Came to Florida or went to Florida. Um, I grew up there. That's where I would say most of my youth roots are. And uh, that's where I was shaped in a in a big way. Um, I became a believer after a tour uh, in Iraq and then went to a Bible school, which I was challenged into missions. And I said, I'll do overseas missions, went to a mission school, met my awesome, wonderful, beautiful wife, Mary there. Um, she was from Oregon. So after we were kind of all trained up and ready to go with um, New Tribes Mission at the time, we uh, were doing some fundraising to be sponsored to go to Africa. We lost our second daughter um, soon after we got uh, um, to Oregon. And that was kind of a, okay, let's slow down. Let's figure some things out. So through a season of grieving, um, I had been getting involved at the local homeless shelter for youth and families called Casa de Belen. And the way I grieve and the way my wife grieves is very different. I stay busy and don't think about hard things. My wife is much more of a processor. So while she was processing at home, investing into our um, daughter Joanna at that time, I would go and work with kids on bikes. And lo and behold, a bicycle program would come out of that called the Umqua Valley Bicycle Outreach. Uh, so it kind of officially started as a real thing in 2016, though I'd been doing it for at least a year. And from there, we just saw that this was a great way to engage more of our, the new phrase is mobile youth. Um, so you're at risk, high risk now called the mobile youth because they're very mobile. They're not uh, stable. They're not staying in one place. They're couch surfing. And um, even with their parents, they're very mobile so just kind of seeing that fixing bikes with these kids and doing life on life with them was very valuable to them. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of started taking one step at a time. As God said, go here. We went there. We ended up getting, uh, we were essentially kicked out of Costa de Belen or just <laughs> let they, we were told non-verbally that we weren't welcome there, but then some other doors opened. We engaged with the active ed or alternative education program at Roseburg high school um, which came to its end, but they would then move to a alternative, their own alternative school. Um, and so that was really cool because that's where for two years, two plus years, I really learned how to work with the professionals or through the professionals, how to work with very high risk mm. or mobile youth. And um, at the same as while that's going on, after we got kind of moved out of Casa de Belen for a season, um, we plugged in with the juvenile department who um, had a couple facilities where they were like group homes for some um, delinquent youth. Man, there was this has been so much change in our area. They went from delinquent youth that were there for doing crimes, which those kids were a lot of fun. I mean, I had Portland gangsters riding bikes through um, <laughs> through the, the back country. And the one kid had King of the Boulevard tattooed on his chest, this yes. hardcore gangster. What kind of bike was he riding? I had a little road bike. Okay, so nice, a nice, like, very basic it? road bike. We were just patching bikes together at that time. And uh, he just saw a cow and he's like, man, check that out, a cow. <laughs> I want to be a farmer. And so you've got this, like, this doesn't fit. You're a gangster. Yeah. He's only 18. 
uh, maybe even 17 gangster from the city riding a road bike in the country saying he wants to be a farmer. So just seeing these kids become kids again yeah. um, outside of their circle of peers was very eye opening. And, I, and huh. we just wanted to at that time realize we wanted to create a place for these youth to become youth to taste the real world as well um, to prepare yeah. them. Uh, but it just kept moving forward. And eventually, right now, we're back at Costa de Blend. We've been given the whole lower level as a bike shop. If you ever saw the promotional video um, that you guys did with us when we were getting that check for the for the match that carrot offered us for that van i had a dream i'm like man it'd be so cool to have a bike shop where kids could clock in and clock out yeah. and experience the real world and now we have that um That's because awesome. the community's like let's give them some room let's give them some space they're still here they're still going forward yeah so it was very encouraging so now um the Rose School, the alternative education program at the school is in a transition period. We don't know what that looks like. We have a drop-in center bike shop so a youth can come and get a shower, grab a bite to eat, get a backpack, get some basic clothes, um, get a bike that they can earn or they can work in the shop with in-store credit and buy a bike off the wall. Um, so we have ways now where we're engaging youth. COVID's definitely slowed us down right now. So the the beauty of that is we can button up a lot of things. Um, yeah. But right now we are, we have a brick and mortar bike shop and we are seeking good partnerships that can help. We can help them introduce their youth to the real world. And we do have a discipleship element where at our general interview, we were asking these kids, Hey man, like, do you even know anything about the Bible? And most of these kids will say, Nope. So we ask them if we can help them understand the basic message of the Bible. Hmm. Most Every kid has done it. Um, a, couple, a couple of them started by saying, nope, not interested, and then say, okay, let's do it. It's interesting. Most of them were, almost all of them were receptive. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. And so we've only had a few kids go through our official apprenticeship. Um, and uh, I'll say more than half of them verbally said, yes, they want to trust Christ. And we've only been able to connect. So this is, we're talking about like, three three youth going through the actual apprenticeship there's other ways kids get involved um one of them is connected with a mentor and another the other one of them bailed before the end looks like he's bailing he's hmm. supposed to be wrapping up this week and another one um man we just didn't realize how much we should be pursuing mentors out of the local church and now we do um so the kid that's got a mentor is doing pretty well and the youth that don't aren't doing that great. So this is actually mm -hmm. our first year of really starting the program because we've been testing and figuring out how best to meet the needs. Yeah. And so we're really hoping that the people in the local church will step up and say, I'll mentor a kid. Let yeah. me know when there's somebody. So we're doing better at matching right. potential mentors. And we don't say, hey, kid, here's your mentor. We have the yeah. adult come in and get the bike fixed and connect and talk about a passion that they have that this youth also has and right. say, Hey, why don't you go, go grab coffee? Yeah. Take them out to lunch. And oh, so yeah. their background checked and all that good stuff. So we do take some of those right. precautions. Okay. But it's really fun. And uh, we do bike rides. So if you're an apprentice, you get paid one day. Um, you get paid in the morning to go for a bike ride with us. It's a ride I mean, for a kid. Yeah, I mean, you're getting paid <laughs> to ride a bike, and yeah. we're teaching them basic commuting <clears throat> safety. One thing we realized is that these the the more mobile youth, they don't necessarily have the ability to sit down in a class yeah. and grasp all this information. Hey, looks to have a one hour lecture. It's not going to necessarily be the way our kids grasp. So like we allow how, them. I like how you said mobile youth as if all youth are so good at sitting still in a classroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so when I say mobile youth, it's kind of like your youth that have never had a stable home. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the hope is that we allow them to absorb over a period of three months in our apprenticeship um, these, these basics to help them be ready for the real world, mm. which is. Every kid, we want them to know the gospel because the power to have self-control comes from Christ. Mm -hmm. um, but you definitely need self-control to manage money, to say, no, I ain't going to have that <laughs> energy drink because I have to pay my phone bill. So we do money management, and then we help them discover, okay, what's your mission? What's your your goal? So I had a young man who's like, I want a Toyota Tacoma and my own piece of property. And he wants a partner Was that the to gangster? do life with. No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> and so it's like... You know, we're not going to talk about you should be married because that's foreign. We're in a 
essentially a post-Christian America. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're not going to say, well, you should be married because we'll get there. Yeah. We'll talk about God's plan when they <laughs> grasp God's plan. Uh, and so he's got this goal and we break it down. So today, what do you need to do to reach that goal, you know, in five mm-hmm. to 10 or 15 years? Yeah. So we really do our best to help them understand if you have a mission and you have a goal, you're not yeah. going to get there overnight which that's also foreign to these kids. They, right. a lot of them have kind of instant gratification. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So I want to dive in and unpack that a little bit, especially we're talking about before we hit record, we are talking about social media and how that impacts you. I want to talk about some of those things, but mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you real quick. So was there, was there one kid or was there any one moment when you started wrenching on bikes with kids that you know, let this spark in you or was like, okay, this is the thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's actually, it's been uh, an awesome relations, seeing how a relationship develops. So I originally met a young man um, and I won't say his name because I'm trying to get him to be an apprentice right now. Mm -hmm. We reconnected, we've connected multiple times um, in the past. So this young man was pushing his bicycle to the skate park because his chain broke. Hmm. I had a chain. This is in the beginning of our outreach. <laughs> like our, this is 2017. And I, and I'm like, ah, okay, I'll give this kid a chain. We don't have a lot of resources, but I helped him put on his chain. He showed up the next week because we were there regularly. Yeah. And at the skate park. At the yeah. skate park. And so with our mo- big mobile bike shop and he was there and then he overhauled a wheel and he was enjoying it. Um, he's in, probably would have been like around eighth grade at that time. Then, we got engaged with the alternative school. He started trying to show up, but got kicked out of school for various reasons that we can't talk about. And um, at the same time, the school said, hey, we're not ready for the bike program yet. So let's pause until the following semester because it was their first semester as a school. Yeah. So I took that young man and I tried to have him become an apprentice. And I saw him light up when he saw his resume that we had to really help him with, but he had very, um, he was struggling with like grammar stuff. So we're like, okay, we helped him build a resume. We framed it. He showed his mom and she was like, yeah, that's nice. Okay. And then she started talking about other things and I'm like, man, this kid has no support. Mm. And seeing him show up feeling proud to wear a bike shop work shirt, like a shop work shirt. Like he was, he lit up, but you know, within a few months, um, He's like, yeah, I just don't know if I want to do this anymore. So he didn't have the endurance. He's never had endurance long term to, mm-hmm. to do anything. And I actually just recently spoke with him about that because I helped him get a bus ticket back to town because he was in a bad place in California. And then we we um, uh, he, we I reengaged him and I said, hey, if you're looking for a job because he was looking for a job, I said this apprenticeship's it. And so now we're kind of struggling to get him to follow through and join this apprenticeship. But I had this, I talked to them endurance. A lot of kids mm-hmm. don't have the endurance. What do you need to have to endurance? You need support. You need a team of people or at least one solid individual saying, you can do this. Let's go for it. Let's try. Right. Let's push forward. Yeah, this is hard, but guess what? Life's not always easy. Right. So without support, hmm. kids will just go from one thing to the other, hoping that they'll have forever happiness like the next girlfriend sorry you're gonna get tired of this girl but if you love her for who she is not how she looks you're more likely to stay that's kind of what i've done over the years with careers and i'm 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 28 now and finally settling into at least uh maybe not one linear career but at least like an area of skills and saying okay i'm gonna stay here because recognize that bouncing around Mm -hmm. the next thing every six months to two years is not gonna really make me happy yeah because you can't i mean you're not gonna work your way up and you have to stick with something yeah. eventually you got to choose it. So I think my, for me, it was probably when I was 30 and I realized, okay, we're going to be in Oregon for a while. And it was like, <laughs> I'm going to stick with bikes. Yeah. And, um, once you stick with something and you grow, you get past, past this hump of the big learning curve that's uncomfortable yeah. and then you start to flourish. And so our youth don't get over the bump. Uh, they don't, they don't have the support system to say, let's keep moving forward. We're going to get over this long bike hill climb. And I love when you ride a bike and you're going over a hill Yeah. and like, Hey dude, the payoff's going to be awesome. There's an awesome downhill it's coming, but feeling. right now we have to push and our quads are hurting and it's like the parallel is in real life. It hurts to learn. My yeah. brain hurts. I heard a kid always right. say that, man, my brain hurts. I'm like, well, the muscles are growing, <laughs> man. They're stretching, they're Every hurting, day. but they're growing. So uh, did, did you have your, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. Oh, did you have like doubts of, uh, I guess like that young man being receptive before, you know, 
just, just simply before you approaching him with a chain saying like, Hey, I can help you out. Um, does that cross your mind? Like this kid is not going to want to have anything to do with me. I'm older. I'm whatever. Probably doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Or are you just like, whatever, I'm going to go for it. Well, <laughs> honestly, the number one thing that causes us to not engage somebody is fear, fear of rejection ourselves. So if we realize that everybody wrestles mm. with that, that kid's wrestling with that, he might want to engage you, but he's scared to engage you. Mm. So if everybody is saying, oh, I'm scared or I don't want to be rejected or unwanted. And yeah, I've been rejected essentially then by some kids who wanted nothing to do with me. Um, but most of the kids, like when we reach out to them when we talk with them they're pretty receptive interesting see i would think that i mean just me personally i would think that a lot of you know youth or young adults would say like no nah, i don't i don't i don't want your advice i don't want your agenda but mm -hmm. that's really encouraging to hear yeah and you don't i mean it's, it's with a relationship that you'll have that effect or um kind of like our initial engagement with the youth was natural because we brought skate park park bikes and skateboards and scooters to the skate park so you'd be engaging these kids on in their grounds in their environment in a way that's meaningful to them which builds some rapport and then they want to hear what you have to say once you've kind of engaged them so i'm not going to show up there and walk onto the skate park and sit next to the kid smoking pot and try to start a conversation because he's <laughs> going to think you're there to to really yeah hammer on him right but when you show up there with us with some stuff and you're like hey dude you want to ride a skateboard you yeah. kind of they, they don't like wearing a helmet but it's like well you gotta wear a helmet otherwise i can't do this and they're right. usually pretty receptive once i mean i had the kids the delinquent youth like the gangster kid from portland saying hey yaku watch this and they do their little tricks and yeah. it was very exciting to see them want your approval for a little trick right and then they start engaging you on real life stuff after so Mm -hmm. Yes, kids are receptive, but don't just walk in there and think that they're going to listen right away. Right. Be a friend first. Hmm. So, so you spend a lot of time. Well, let me ask you, you do spend a lot of time uh, as the middleman between parents and the kids. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a, it comes in waves. Yeah. Um, a lot of the youth that we work with, their parents are disengaged. Hmm. Um, but there is the occasional time that you'll have a parent call and say, um yeah my kid's not listening and blah 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 and um, a lot of times these parents are too engaged there's a season of life um where we walk with our kids every step of the way when yeah. they're infants and when they're in elementary school but at some point in time hopefully they're able to try it on their own you're taking the training wheels off you're going to crash yeah. we have to let our kids crash yeah and let them learn this is why we look up like you don't look down at your tire while you're riding yeah. you're gonna run into a wall the same way you got to let your kids sometimes run into a wall there are healthy boundaries we don't want them to go and get into like drugs of course yeah. but there are ways to let them kind of run into some walls and then you have to have a relationship with them to talk with them about it hmm. so if you are always on top of them for everything and they know if they come to you with a dad um uh, I drank last weekend and you blow up all oh, you. I told you you should never do that. Like, well, yeah, your kid wanted to be vulnerable. And so we need to allow our kids to talk to us. My wife is amazing at this mm. and I try to be better. I go, I call my wife and talk with her all the time. She's like my relationship coach. Cause I'm not naturally task oriented, but, um, truly you need to be able to be in a place where you can have a conversation and hear them out first. I mean, right. isn't that what the Bible talks about? It's like, Hey, be yeah. slow to speak. Well, I love what you said that, <clears throat> that they wanted to be vulnerable and it's easy for us to, <clears throat> excuse me, even with other adults, easy to, you know, dismiss that or not, or blow right past it. And I mm -hmm. recognize it. Like it took that person a lot of courage or strength to yep. come up and say, Hey, this is the thing that I'm struggling with, or this is where I'm at. Like that right there is huge. And just pausing and saying mm -hmm. like, sweet, you know, this is a starting point. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's really good if you have younger kids <clears throat> to start now allowing them the opportunity to speak. Hmm. So a lot of times now, um, I, my oldest is seven Yeah. that I can start practicing listening now because if you're a listener, if your if your kids can feel heard, they will come back and talk with you. Mm. But if right now your daughter wants to tell you something and you cut her off 
and you don't let them speak, they won't speak. They're, you're, we're teaching them to not talk to us. Yeah. And then we're angry when they're in their teens and they only talk to their friends. And you really don't want mm. teens being mentored by teens because they don't have life experience. So. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, we think of ourselves as, I think of myself as like the parent. Oh, like since my son was born, it's like, okay, how do I not break him? How do I give him alive? <clears throat> Excuse me. But then how do I train him? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what do I need to tell him? You know, what do I need to say? And yeah. so it's, it's not always about that. It's a half and half at least, you know, just listen to them. Yep. So that's a major tip. Be slow to speak, quick to listen, hear their side of it. Yeah. Um, and I would always say, when you're in these conversations and you see something clearly help them connect the dots by asking open-ended questions. Another thing that my wife's better at than I, um, but to remind yourself, okay, I can breathe for a moment. Think about what question can I ask that will help them see what I see. Hmm. So you, a lot of kids um, don't want to open up to people, whether they feel like they, you know, I mean, just as humans, like, Hey, you don't understand me. You don't, you don't get what I'm going through, whether that's depression, anxiety, you know, issues with friends, school, it's like, you don't get me. Um, what do you suggest as far as connecting with someone and getting them to open that up, open, open up with you, whether that's, you know, something you say or time or certain things, like, how do you start to, as a parent or as a volunteer, uh, get someone to the point where they're comfortable you know, just sharing their struggle with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really about relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have a relationship with somebody before they share. Yeah. Um, so what we've seen is in three months, for some of our youth, even though we have a pretty decent relationship with them, some of them are still not ready to share. Mm -hmm. So what that tells you is you need an adult or somebody stable um, to come alongside of them for a longer period of time to be a listener mm -hmm. for a while. And a lot of these kids have had people come and go. So if you are engaging them for a month or two, don't be frustrated when they're not opening up yet, because guess what? They're still not sure if you're really going right. to stay. It might be, you. yeah, it might be six months, it might be a year. So for us to have that patience to kind of push through that season, um, that is really hard. Huh. But once you break through that time barrier that they have somewhere in their mind, like um, they don't even know what that time frame is. Yeah. Um, but once they push through that and they realize like deep down that they can trust you, that's when yeah. beautiful things happen. Yeah. But once again, I'm very task oriented. So if I, when I engage <laughs> a kid, I, this is something I have to constantly remind myself of like, uh -huh. they don't know me yet. Yeah. It's been three months, but they don't know me yet. Um, yeah. so it's relationships, it's time and those youth, if they feel heard, if you listen to them, and you don't tell them if you ask them good questions. Once again, I'm not good at this. I understand the concept that I struggle to play to do it the right way. Um, then I think you're going to see the fruit of that time investment mm. and the patience of listening first. All right. So it's not it's not easy, but it is simple. It's very it's simple. We overcomplicate. <laughs> we overcomplicate everything. Um, it's yeah. very simple. We need to learn to slow down, let go, let God kind of a mentality it's like okay um yeah so you see parents do that too i mean it's like you know like when you said the kid will say you know i went out and drank last weekend and the parent you know blows up or wants to give them advice or you know initial thought is how can i fix this what mm -hmm. do i especially as dudes like what do i need to do to fix this yeah. fixers uh but maybe we don't give it enough time. Like maybe that relationship hasn't started yet, yeah. especially if they're teenagers, yeah. like maybe they need to see us, you know, showing up for conversations and mm -hmm. asking them for, for, like you said, for three months, you know, even if they're our own kids or our own friends, family members, spouses in mm -hmm. our own house, like they want to see that consistency before they open up. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Yeah. What's, what's powerful um, for me, something my, my dad always said, He's like, don't do as I do, do as I say. Yeah. Drove me nuts. Instant Wait. anger. He always oh, said yeah, that. Yeah. Don't do what I say. He said, don't, he said, don't do what I do, do what I say. Yeah. And um, man, you have to model for these youth. And so what we try our best to do is to make sure we are modeling what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so so that's huge. There was something else I was gonna say. Um, oh, for the youth that says, Dad, I drank last weekend. If they're coming to you 
a question to maybe ask once they've vented a little bit. Well, what did you learn? What if they've already learned hmm. I shouldn't do it? Dad, I woke up the next morning in my truck, muddy, and I puked everywhere. Well, so yeah. what'd you learn? I'm not doing that again. Wow, you built a relationship? And they've already learned the lesson yeah. with the enough consequence of they've got puke all through their truck. <laughs> and that might be a personal story about the truck. You but uh, <laughs> you did nothing. Yeah. Well, you so <laughs> I didn't tell my dad. Uh, but in my oh, teens, was your, oh, that's this... it. Yeah. So that was me. Like I learned, don't drink because this was disgusting. And so, you know, you we that's learn awesome. things and that's what our teenagers need to do. Um, Wait, I have to, sorry, I have to ask, you were muddy or the truck was muddy? I don't know. I woke up in my truck. Oh. <laughs> I was very dirty. So, okay. yeah. And that's where um, we we learn lessons. I'm yeah. not, it's not, a, a, I don't want a war story, but it's like, that was a valuable lesson to me. Why am I doing this? I'm ruining my life. I probably was an idiot last night. Yeah. Um, and thank goodness there wasn't social media back then, but that's a huge thing that our kids the I can't even imagine what it's like to be a teenager and somebody has a picture of you um, yeah. and that starts to circulate the the shaming. And so we have to realize that our teens and our middle schoolers, preteens, they are um, facing a, the next level of peer influence, pressure, mm -hmm. shaming, very, very scary. And um, I'm, I got out of high school before social media yeah. was a legit thing. I could go home and get away right. from peer pressure. Our kids can't. There right. is no escape. And yeah. I don't know the, the, the internal impact that that has on kids has to be devastating if they are constantly targets. So that's yeah. something for every parent to kind of keep in mind. We're going to keep our kids away from social media and phones as long as possible. Yeah. Um, realizing that we're, we have, we're going to face that. We need to prepare that now. So we talk to our kids about like, Hey, why are you scrolling around on the computer? I know you're looking for the next song because we have our, you know, music yeah. playlist on there. And I'm like, it's just very dangerous. This computer, this screen is very dangerous. So our kids are realizing there's something dangerous here. I know I can trust mom and dad. Um, they don't grasp it yet. But when our daughter right. goes to middle school, uh, that age range, I'm sure it's going to be like, I really want social media. I really want a smartphone. Right. Um, so I'm going to pause right there and say, if no, have you seen the social network? Wait, no. Excuse me. No. Backtrack, not the social network, um, the social dilemma. I think I've heard about it. I've not. Yeah, the social dilemma. Yeah, the social network was the movie about Facebook a few years ago, Jesse Eisenberg. The social dilemma. Um, you got to watch that. It basically, um, especially any parents listening to this, I mean, humans need to watch it, but it's <clears throat> it's kind of about uh, the issues that, you know, tech and social media and us being very ingrained in our devices has brought into our culture. And I think a big part of it, kind of the synthesis of it, is that it's trained us to browse without knowing it. So we're constantly browsing. Mm. I mean, adults, kids, everyone, we just browse and you feel it. You don't always like put a conscious thought to mm. it and be like, oh yeah, I'm mindlessly browsing. We'll say like, oh, I was just scrolling through Facebook, whatever. Mm. But I mean, it doesn't matter if it's email or a website or social, whatever. Like we're just trained to constantly browse because all of these apps, um, they have to, they're paid to get our attention. They monetize off of our attention. So anyways, I just wanted to say that if you haven't seen that, go watch it amazingly powerful okay. to kind of open your eyes up to like the dangers of social. Um, and I'm not saying like, Oh, social media is this big evil thing. It started as a project by real humans with decent intentions, yep. sometimes yep. good, sometimes bad. Um, and then got out of control because it's for profit. And mm -hmm. that's Where can somebody go to find that? It's on Netflix. Um, so I know a lot of people got issues right now with Netflix. Is it? Yeah. But unfortunately, it's only on Netflix. Okay, it is only on there. You can probably download it from Russia if you got a friend who can, I don't know. Well, <laughs> Just get, kidding. Get your free trial. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh... Don't yeah, me. there we go. Yeah, just kidding. Don't don't go torrent it from Russia if you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> I don't support that. Um, I went off on that for so long, I forgot where I was going. Um, oh, so so tell me for a sec about, you know, youth growing up right now versus, you know, even just you and I, you know, so you're a few years older than me, but I, you know, I remember when you couldn't sign up for Facebook unless you were affiliated mm -hmm. with a college, 
and then it was 18 and they kept lowering the bar. You know, I grew up when like MySpace was huge. Um, but I still had a good chunk of life before that. It was freaking great. Yeah, you only it was you look you look back and see the greatness of that yeah. that season where you were not browsing, you weren't distracted, you could do something and on a regular basis you were outside with humans, face yeah. to face, engaging one another. So even outside social media, um, there's this term I, I came across a couple weeks ago talking to someone, and I can't remember the term, uh, but it was uh, basically uh, talking about peers looking to, peer is one of the words in the term, but it's peers looking to their peers for guidance, for leadership, mm-hmm. um, you know, being led by your peers. So how do you, how do you see that? Like, how does that play out? Because that, that wasn't, I don't really feel like that was the case for me growing up and mm-hmm. I can only speak for my story, but I guess this is more of a thing now where uh, youth are less looking to adults and their parents and more to each other. Mm-hmm. Do you yeah, see that? Absolutely. Um, most of the youth that we pursue to work in our program are those mobile youth, very unstable, kicked out of homes or, mm-hmm. you know, essentially they were neglected by their parents or abused and they ran. Um, Mm -hmm. that's not uncommon. Um, and the source is drugs and pornography, you know, that destroys homes. Those are usually two of the big things and money, of course, but huge in our area is drugs. Mm -hmm. It's a growing issue. So, um, parents get hooked on that. I've had a, a young man who I don't even know where he's at now, but he was 12 when one of his mom's friends said, Hey, you should try some meth and he's addicted. Um, and very, very destructive as that's how it's been in his life. Yeah. Now, um, when you remove, you know, when you don't do it God's way, God's plan is yeah. stable family, a mom and a dad that teach you how to be a man and how to be a respectful man towards a woman. When you take that out and you take this person, these people away, that's taught, that's supposed to teach them how to do life well, mm-hmm. um, man, like what, what the only place is what they are, they need relationships, youth need community. And if they're not going to find boundaries at, with their parents, um, they're just going to go off the edge. Um, yeah. And it's going to be, I'm going to be with my friends who you are surrounded with is who you become. And when mm-hmm. it's no stable adult there, the result is, you know, you can just assume that it's not going to be good. Yeah. If it, I mean, some kids, somehow do pretty well. We, uh, one of our first apprentices, um, very interesting uh, place that we found him in and mm. he's doing really well. Just says he, he kind of learned like me. Um, he saw something bad and he's like, well, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So he visual visually could see things and that determined where he would take his next step. A lot of kids don't like that. They're like, well, I'm going to do it too. Cause I want to fit in peer right. pressure. Um, so Hmm. it's the, the disintegration of the family unit, man. That's really what it boils down to, um, as that I would think is the main cause and what causes the family disintegration is things get prioritized that aren't priorities or shouldn't be, whether it's drugs, money, sex, which destroys relationships and then marriages fall apart. Um, Right. So you guys are coming in as mentors where, you know, where you can't, you can't always plug a parent back in. Yeah. What, what do you see the, the biggest power of mentor as in a kid's life? Like how can they tap in when there's no parent or the parent can't tap in? Yeah. And when it works well, it works well. Hmm. And it's really, I'm, I'd say it's more on the mentor, the mentor. We're trying to help our mentors understand. So even in one of our brochures, it says like, Hey, realize that youth who have been traumatized, neglected, and abused, they need more time in a relationship before that relationship becomes effective. So you need to understand this on the front end because it could be three, six, nine, 12 months before you have a first meaningful conversation. So uh, my father-in-law is actually reaching out to a young man and he's like, hey, for the last three weeks, I haven't engaged with this young man. Well, I luckily was able to he answered my phone call. <laughs> he thought I was calling for one reason, which I wasn't calling. I did not know he went to jail, um, <laughs> but he unknowingly confessed that. And we had lunch and talked about it. And I just helped him understand the value of a mentor. Hmm. Um, so the hope is that he'll, he sees that and is going to re-engage with his mentor because 
I mean, his name, my, my father-in-law um, is willing to be there. Yeah. And um, that's the hard part is that time commitment on the front end. But then that kid will continue to be a part of your life. So it's mm. time, time and effort. And it's not a lot of effort. It's a text message and a phone call. Right. You know, you don't have to um, show up at their door every time. Right. You might start that way. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and there's, it seems like, I mean, I think you are still doing your job and you still, you know, run with Youth for Christ or running the bike shop is a pretty good testament to the fact that there's a big payoff in it for the men, mentor. Oh, yeah. 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 There's nothing. Um, and the Christian and the person with the Christian worldview in um, when you see God allowing the fruit of your labor to be revealed, it's huge. A lot of times it's there and you just don't see it for a while. Interesting. But like when we have a kid that we had like a transgender, uh, so a trans ma uh, male, trans no, sorry, trans woman, male transitioning into a woman uh -huh. um, on Halloween when they just show up. Hey, Yaku, how's it going? Whoa, I didn't even know that I had a great relationship with you, but they went out of their way hmm. to come to our house to get some candy and have a conversation. So it's... And we've had hard conversations because yeah. they would ask hard questions mm. about their path that they're on. Um, and we always say like, hey, this is what Jesus says. And if he's God and he wants what's best for you and he says this is the way, I believe it. Mm. And I want you to believe that. Um, so it's it's really hard to see the fruit in the front end. I believe it's mm. there. But that fruit, if, it's, if that vine isn't... Um, pruned and taken care of the, that relationship won't last yeah so it is long-term awesome. relationship i love what you said too about <clears throat> excuse me about um if if this is god saying this because that's not where i thought you were gonna go i thought you were gonna say if this is god saying this and god you know uh knows what's best for you or god understands everything or made the rules i think where a lot of parents had I love how you said, this is what God wants for you. Mm -hmm. You know, God, if like, if, if I'm a great dad, uh, then God is the, God is the best dad that we could ever have. So I love how you said that. Cause I think it's a great way to, you know, as if you're a Christian parent to be able to explain to your kid, this isn't, you know, this isn't religion. This isn't, you know, this is the reason why I'm telling you this is because mm -hmm. somebody bigger than me wants something really good for you mm -hmm. instead of looking at God as the dictator or religion or set of rules. And that's, um, I forget what study, I think I heard it at church, there was a study and they were asking people at a coffee shop, not a study, so yeah, I think that for free coffee, you'd have to tell them what's the first three words or two words in the Bible mm. and we, it's in the beginning, <clears throat> Yeah. but they said thou shalt not was actually the most common. Ooh. <laughs> and oh, so man, that hurts. Yeah. And oh, that hurts. it just shows you that um there's this wow. This deceit. You know, Satan's very tricky. And yeah. we think unbelievers believe that God is a God that is a dictator that says, Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And we have to help youth understand. So for me, for my kids at their very young age, um, our we have a little foster boy with us, and he loves to look down while he rides his bike. And I stopped him and I said, Hey, like we really have to look forward. <laughs> you can't be looking down. Yeah. And he'll try to do it the right way. And then he will, I'll catch him looking down. Another thing he had to do before we could go ride to the park was use his pedal brake. So pedal backwards to stop. And he had to show me he could do it and he could do it. And so we are riding at the park, a little tiny downhill coming at a place to, at an intersection. That's not high traffic. And I said, Look up, look up, you gotta look up, pedal back, pedal, stop, break, break. And he's like looking down, pedaling forward, not looking where he goes, oh. over the handlebars, over the curb, hits his head on the ground. Luckily, he has a helmet on, yeah. but he bit his lip and he's bleeding and <laughs> weeping. And once he calms yeah. down, I'm like, well, what did daddy ask you to do? Look, look, look up and break. <laughs> and I'm like, did daddy want what's best for you? And he's here, bloody, and I just, he was sobbing mess and just, like daddy wanted what's best for you. I wasn't trying to be a dictator. I was trying to save your life. Yeah. So trust daddy. And I was too far to be able to help. And you know, if our kids can see that, we try to point that out as many times as we can. Daddy wants what's best for you. That's why I say, 
please mm. clean up your room. Daddy wants what's best for you. Yeah. Uh, mommy wants what's best for you. And this is why we say these things. Not you better do this or else right. because that's a dictator. At yeah. least it feels like one, even though we do want, want what's best. We have to communicate that very clearly with kids. And that's what we do in the bike shop. Yeah. So if our kids come and they're with us for three months. Hey, start the threads with your hand. And then they end up stripping out a fitting <laughs> And okay, now the process is gonna be a lot harder. We actually now have to remove this crank arm uh, with a, a very difficult way because you chose not to follow right. instructions. And so we help these kids see that. And we point them back to scripture. It's like, that's what God says. Like, yeah. he's not trying to rule your life. He's trying <laughs> to help you have the best life possible. Right. I feel like I am, like even at 28, I am that little kid, you know, sometimes in life, just yeah. like on my bike pedaling as freaking fast as I can. Like if I can will my way through this, if I can go faster, mm -hmm. just get to this thing, just staring at the ground. When God's saying like, hey, when you're getting yeah. further away, yeah. you should probably look up and listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's our first core value. And every kid should know by the time they're in a program for a few weeks, it's humility. It's acknowledging. Look up. <laughs> well, <laughs> look it's up it's the... humility. It's it's the understanding of like, I don't have it all together. I don't know all things. Mm. And I need to have an attitude that reflects that. Like that's I huge. am not the all knowing that I might be wrong, yeah. that I don't have it all together. Second core value is teachability. Can we teach you a different way? If you're willing to be taught a different way, at least the understanding of it a different way, and you're humble, we're off to a great start. Yeah. But if you think you've got it all together, which is pride, and a lot of times our little kids, they're very proud and very prideful. They will not listen to what you have to say. They might have to bust their heads on the concrete, mm -hmm. have a bloody lip, and be weeping before they realize, okay, I don't have it all together. <laughs> and... For our, for our kids at the shop, it's like, hey, you didn't want to follow instructions. This is a consequence-free learning environment. But in the real world, there's bigger consequences. Right. Hmm. And they learn the value of being humble and teachable. So. I love that. Well, thanks for sharing, man. This I feel like this has been really good, really good convo for me as a dad, um, you know, and just someone that can uh, mentor youth and talk with other parents as well. My One of my... Uh, kind of the direction I thought I was going to head with this interview was like the biggest, you know, misconceptions, uh, with youth and what they struggle with. And, and I love where the interview went. I think we did cover a lot of that, but I think it, it, I didn't realize how quickly it would get answered way in the beginning of that. Uh, for me, it was hearing youth are receptive in general. They want to hear what we have to say. And so many times, like you said, we let fear of rejection get in the way of like, ah, they're not going to want to hear what I have to say. They're not going to want to hang out or listen to me, whatever. But they need and want to be led. Mm -hmm. They might just be waiting for you to make the move as a parent, mentor, teacher, brother, sister, spouse. Yeah, I love that. Um, I want to wrap it up. And I just want to ask you this question. Um, what's, what's one thing you wish... Uh, everyone listening to this could understand if you want people to just really know it, uh, one thing, what's that thing, man. Um, if you are, you know, an adult, so if you're 18 and up and you're pretty solid and you're not trying to, you know, discover. And like, if you have, you have a good understanding of how life works, seek out somebody who doesn't, who, um, we, we need people to come alongside of people and we are so caught up in our own little worlds that very few people look outward out of their, you know, their own lives to bring somebody along for the, the ride. So we, we just need more people that have their feet underneath of them and that say, Hey, maybe I'm going to watch less Netflix or maybe I'm going to yeah. do less of something that's less valuable and do more of what is valuable, which is coming alongside of somebody who's struggling. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I appreciate that. Appreciate you sharing. It's been a good convo. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing Yaku. We're going to wrap this up um, again. Uh, make sure to follow us on Facebook comeback story. We're doing these live Q and A's uh, subscribe to the podcast. If you got value out of this, tell a friend, leave us a re rating and review. Last month was the most popular month of this podcast, uh, which was awesome. In December, when people aren't usually listening to podcasts, we had a big boost. So it's nice. really encouraging to see people listening and following along and supporting Comeback Stories. Um, and if you'd like to support Comeback Story, the podcast, uh, find out how at mycomebackstory.com. Thanks again, Yaku. We'll see right you on. later. Thanks for having me. See ya.